Icarus, At the Edge of Time, by Brian Greene, author of The Elegant Universe. As the starship Proxima hurtled through space, Icarus looked longingly at the distant stars. It was the only view he knew. It was meant to be the only view he'd ever know. He had been born on the Proxima, as had his father and his father's father. The Proxima was on a unique quest. Astronomers had picked up faint radio signals from a planet much like Earth that was orbiting Proxima Centauri, the star closest to the Sun. Once deciphered, the radio communications confirmed what many had long thought. We are not alone in the cosmos. Wild excitement and unprecedented global scientific cooperation followed, with the world's nations combining their resources and expertise to launch a human expedition to the stars, a rendezvous with the first life discovered beyond Earth's shores. Icarus's great-grandfather was chosen to lead the mission. But even with the Proxima's stellar speed, a 25 trillion mile journey could not be completed in a single lifetime. Icarus's great-grandfather had thus committed not only himself, but his children, his children's children, his children's children's children, and his children's 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 children. Only the fifth generation of this spacefaring family could witness the journey's end and live in a world other than the Proxima. Icarus had just turned 14. Only recently had he grasped that not only had he been born on the Proxima, he would eventually die there. There were others on board like him. It took many families to provide the next generation that would replace an aging crew and start the cycle anew. Yet, as most everyone had come to realize, Icarus was different. Not only had he mastered schoolwork way beyond his years and become the youngest and most accomplished pilot of the Proxima's fleet of agile runabouts, but he had a palpable yearning for something beyond the life he'd been handed. Suddenly, Icarus heard the Proxima's captain. Everyone, immediately to your stations, the captain bellowed over the ship's loudspeakers. We are making an emergency course diversion to avoid an uncharted black hole. Wow, thought Icarus, a black hole, a real black hole. Icarus quickly joined his father at their adjacent consoles, but he was visibly frustrated. The Proxima has been hurtling through space for nearly a hundred years, and now, finally, we come upon something spectacular and unexpected, and we're not even going to try to explore it? His father knew well Icarus's wanderlust, so thought it best to simply remind him of the looming peril of a black hole. Son, a black hole's gravitational pull is so enormous that were we to fall in, we'd never get out. Yes, of course, Icarus shot back. I know that. But so long as we don't get too close, there shouldn't be any danger. And with my new design for the runabout's micro-warp drives, I'm pretty sure that a good pilot would be able to pull away even after grazing a black hole's surface. His father smiled. Your new engine design is very clever, and if the prototype continues to hold up under careful testing, it may one day transform space travel. But that day is far off. You and I and everyone on board this ship have one mission, and we must devote everything to its success. We can't take unnecessary chances. There will be no black hole grazing for us. Really? Icarus thought. Here was his chance to be someone, to be more than just a link in a chain stretching from an Earth he'd never walked to an alien planet he'd never see. No one in history had explored a black hole. No one had even gone near one. Icarus quickly turned the calculations he'd used to create his new engine over and over in his mind, checking and rechecking the figures. And he definitively concluded that his redesigned runabout could triumph over the powerful pull of a black hole. With his father occupied making adjustments to the ship's course, Icarus seized the opportunity to slip quietly away from his console and rush down to the docking station. Using the codes he'd cracked years ago during computer training, he released his runabout from the Proxima and headed straight for the surface of the black hole. Moments later, the runabout's radio crackled. This is an unauthorized journey. Return to the Proxima at once, the captain urgently commanded. Icarus didn't reply. The captain repeated his order, but Icarus stayed on course for the black hole. 
The next voice was his father's. Icarus, turn back. Don't go near the black hole. You won't survive. Icarus answered, I'm sorry, Dad. I must go. It's my one chance. But don't worry. I've built the micro warp drive engine. I've done the calculations, and I'm the best pilot. I will make it. Icarus shut off his radio. Oh, Icarus, his father pleaded over the icy stillness of space. Even if you can do what no pilot has ever done, in your calculations you didn't take an account of time, the slowing of time near the black hole's edge. But Icarus couldn't hear his father's words and headed onward. Can't you save him? Icarus's father implored the ship's captain. He's just a headstrong 14-year-old kid. His great-grandfather headed this mission, and he's my only son. I'm sorry, the captain answered solemnly. We have protocols, and they are very clear. My responsibility is to this ship and its mission, not to a reckless boy. There is nothing I can do. Icarus's father watched, heartbroken, through the ship's powerful microscope, telescope, as the runabout neared the black hole. And as it did, he could see what Einstein long ago had predicted would happen. He saw time slowing down for his son. He watched as Icarus worked the runabout's controls with the confidence of someone many years his senior. But all his motions, from the turning of his head to the blinking of his eyes, were slowing. To his father, Icarus appeared as though he were in a film being projected in slow motion. And as the runabout closed in on the black hole's edge, the slowing of the film, the slowing of time, became increasingly dramatic. My poor Icarus, his father murmured gravely, since everything is slowing, even your thoughts, it will seem like time is passing just as it always does. You won't even notice what's happening to you. As his father anxiously looked on, Icarus's movement slowed to the point where he appeared almost frozen. His father turned from the telescope. His son was slipping away, and he couldn't bear to watch any more. On board the runabout, Icarus was in high gear. His hands raced across the, cons the console, adjusting here, fiddling there. He just measured the black hole's mass so he knew precisely how close he could safely venture. And so... On he went, perfectly executing a glancing trajectory in which he momentarily swooped to a hair's breadth above the point of no return. The runabout performed exactly as he had calculated, easily pulling away from the black hole's edge. Two, three, four, five times he completed the same maneuver, even doing a full circle along the black hole's horizon on a last whirlwind ride, hovering along the very edge of the gravitational abyss. Icarus's heart was pounding as he pulled away from the black hole for the final time and headed back towards the Proxima. That will surely be remembered, he said to himself as he flipped on the radio. Dad, what do you think now? he asked trying his best not to sound too self-congratulatory. I'm the first person to journey to the edge of a black hole. There was no response. He hailed the Proxima again. No answer. Could the black hole have disrupted the radio? He wondered. But he couldn't think of any reason why that would happen. As he approached the location where he'd left the Proxima, Icarus couldn't believe what he was seeing. Hundreds of enormous, luminous starships of a design he'd never seen were rushing along what appeared to be an interstellar highway. What in the world is this? Icarus asked himself, slowly and quietly. A patrol ship, larger and even more imposing than the others, approached his runabout and signaled him to dock. Icarus was rushed was ushered into an enormous complex filled with gleaming equipment aglow with activity whose functions he couldn't even imagine. Welcome. But where, may I ask, did you get that? The patrol captain said, pointing across the observation deck to Icarus's docked runabout. Our sensors indicate that model hasn't been used in at least five, maybe even ten thousand years. What? replied Icarus. What do you mean? His face tightened. It's a real beauty. Hard to believe it could be restored to working order, the patrol captain continued. But I, I don't understand, Icarus said. I only just left the Proxima an hour ago, and there was certainly no other ships in the area. How could there have been? We were the first. The Proxima? 
the patrol captain said, her eyes squinting. This is the Proxima Interstellar Causeway, named after the pioneering Proxima spaceship that first traveled this route thousands of years ago. Is that what you mean? And then in a flash it hit him. Icarus understood what had happened. Gravity and time, gravity and time, he said over and over, almost buckling under the weight of what had suddenly become clear. I didn't take account of gravity and time. He realized that the black hole's strong gravitational pull had slowed his passage through time immensely. What seemed like an hour for him was thousands of years for everyone else. He had indeed returned to the place where he had left the Proxima, but he'd returned at a very different time. Icarus's journey had unwittingly taken him far into the future. His father and everyone and everything he'd ever known had been gone for millennia. Icarus ached to the core of his being. He wanted to yell out for his father, to at least apologize for not heeding his desperate warnings, but he knew his cries would fall upon the deafness of time. "'We've been instructed to take you to the command central,' the captain said. "'It will take a few earth hours, so allow my officers to escort you to our library.' There, Icarus encountered a gigantic glass panel hovering in a cavernous hall. It was an electronic repository combining, containing all of the galaxy's information. It's a bit intimidating at first, the ship's librarian said gently to Icarus, but I've been told of your situation, and I took the liberty of programming a personal tour that I think will be suited to your interests. Icarus put on the visor she handed him. As Icarus watched the presentations, stunned, he learned about the Proxima's successful conclusion of its journey some 10,000 years earlier, and the grand and fruitful era of interstellar cooperation that followed. He read about the formation of a galactic government and Earth's role as the galactic court, settling disputes and ensuring a lasting peace. And he read about the extraordinary discoveries in his favorite fields of physics and cosmology. And then he learned of a legend that parents had been telling their children for thousands of years, a cautionary tale that had been passed down from generation to generation. It told of a boy who, despite his father's warnings, flew a small ship close to a black hole, a boy who, as legend had it, was never seen again. The End To my son, Alec, and the memory of my father, Alan, with a Love That Transcends All Time, by Brian Green, Art Directions and Design by Chip Kidd, all images courtesy of NASA and the Mobile Space Telescope. A Note on the Science Black holes are regions of space filled with such intense gravity that anything which gets too close, even light, is unable to escape. Although Albert Einstein's insights led to the modern idea of a black hole, he remained skeptical about their existence. Yet, in the decades since, a wealth of astronomical observations have provided strong evidence that black holes not only exist in the cosmos, they're commonplace. Black holes have a profound effect on time. Their gravitational force pulls on time itself, slowing its rate of passage even more as one gets ever nearer a black hole's edge. Because of this, black holes provide for a specific kind of time travel. Were you to hover near the edge of a black hole, time for you would pass more slowly than for everyone else who remained far away. On returning to Earth, you would thus find that hundreds or even thousands of years had elapsed, depending on the size of the black hole and how close you ventured to its edge. Scientists still haven't figured out what happens at the very center of a black hole. Some have suggested that a black hole's center is where time comes to an end, while others have proposed that it's a portal to another universe. Finding the definitive answer is widely recognized as one of the great remaining challenges in our continuing quest to understand space, time, and the cosmos. That was Icarus at the Edge of Time by Brian Greene.